Hello, everyone, and welcome to our next, our first EDW session of the day called Legislation Labyrinth, Navigating Global Privacy Laws Along the Asset Lifecycle, which will be presented by Frederick Forsland, the Vice President and Enterprise uh, and Cloud Erasure Solutions at Blanco. All audience members are muted during these sessions, so please submit your questions in the Q&A window on the right-hand side of your screen, and our speaker will respond to as many questions as possible at the end of the talk. Please know that there is a linked form at the bottom of the page titled EDW Conference Session Survey. This is where you can submit session feedback and we encourage you to do so. If you can't see the slides, we're gonna be getting those updated shortly. Just keep, keep hitting the refresh button and those will appear in the bottom of the page. So let's begin our presentation now. Thank you and welcome Frederick. Thank you very much, uh, Shannon. And uh, a very good uh, pronunciation there on my name. Uh, as you can see uh, from the background drop and hear from my accent, I am connecting from Sweden. So you have 40 minutes of Swedish accent to look forward to uh, as we navigate uh, today's uh, topic. Uh, we'll make sure to break uh, after 40 minutes and take any Q&A uh, that uh, might have come in. And the aim today is to make sure that you understand the basics of data sanitization. I'll position this in uh, uh, where we are today, uh, where we see new patterns in the way we work and handle our infrastructure. Um, I will um, uh, take that insight into uh, sharing some innovation that we have seen in the marketplace. Uh, over the last uh, one plus year. Uh, and then we will end off with uh, a very important topic and explain how sustainability relates uh, to today's topic. So with that said, let's dive in uh, together and um, uh, start by defining data sanitization. Um, data end of life is a good way of uh, thinking about this topic. Uh, if we look at Gartner's um, uh, definition, it is about the process of completely removing all data. How can we achieve this? Uh, why do we want to achieve it? We want to be uh, compliant. We want to make sure we have um, uh, audit trail, that we have control over this topic. Um, and how do we achieve it? Well, we come to a crossroad, basically. Uh, if we turn left on this crossroad, we are actually destroying the storage media itself to protect the information. The other turning, if we turn to the right, we are using different software options, uh, cryptographic erasure, data erasure, uh, which is all part of software solutions in the market today, uh, where we can uh, make sure that there's absolutely no data left. It's the same high level of security if you do a proper destruction as if you do a proper software process. Uh, and that is how you achieve the data sanitization. So that's the definition I want you to stand on uh, for the rest of uh, the talk. And then a first question, how mature do we think that this um, uh, topic or area is in the market today? Well, uh, from time to time, we, we're testing this. How, how is the maturity? Um, this is an example when we contacted different eBay sites with professional sellers selling hardware equipment, where all sellers guaranteed that the equipment was free from data. And uh, uh, buying 159 drives, combination of SSD and HDDs, sensitive data was found on 66 of these and that was only using very quick software-based analysis 25 of those drives had personal identifiable information 
which means that depending on your jurisdiction, you are in breach uh, of uh, data privacy laws. And as we know today, those fines can be quite hefty. So the conclusion is that there's still a lot of uh, immaturity in uh, uh, this segment of cybersecurity and data protection. Uh, Gartner is telling us that we have reached somewhere uh, just over 30% and aiming uh, towards 50% uh, of market penetration within the next uh, uh, few years. Uh, so there's still a lot of work to do. So it's quite a big audience here today. All of you that are listening in, please help me spread the awareness on this topic. It's absolutely critical that as many people as possible understand this area well, especially the way we see legislation and requirements uh, developing. So uh, a quick uh, storytelling from a news channel where they did um, uh, uh, a report on this uh, where they went out and asked uh, people uh, if they thought that it was enough to reformat an old drive, uh, which could be the reason why we saw the eBay drives keeping uh, uh, information to the level uh, that we just uh, shared. Um, they did a survey around this news report and concluded that two in three people believe that that is sufficient. Um, when uh, uh, you have information from a seller that it has been reformatted, it is easy to do a quick test. Uh, you take it to someone that can download a forensic software that can um, uh, quickly scan the drive for any patterns and quickly uh, put that into uh, uh, data that can be read. And from this um, uh, quick news flash that they did, they found uh, compromising photos, passport information, very sensitive work files, including blueprints. Uh, and once again, awareness, awareness, awareness about what is good and what is bad processes. Uh, the journalist concluded that you could use software overwrite, uh, but also that you had the physical destruction options. And if we go into a little bit more detail there, you have both degaussing as well as physically destroying uh, a drive. And let's talk a little bit more about that. Uh, first of all, some uh, summary statistics. When we did a survey uh, amongst uh, large global companies, uh, more than 5,000 employees, uh, a very big sample of uh, uh, companies around the world from large uh, industry verticals were covered, 36% of everyone uh, was using either formatting or inadequate free software that leaves data behind, um, using some sort of destruction process but with complete lack of audit trail or control, or maybe your own home-baked uh, overwriting but not including any verification or testing that this had been done correctly. 4% uh, had no methods in place at all. So uh, the collective data tells us that uh, over a third had no uh, good processes in place. So that rhymes with uh, the Gartner information that there's still a lot of work to do here. Usually the larger enterprises are the most uh, uh, educated here. Uh, but there's still a lot uh, of work left. So let's talk about physical destruction. Uh, what you see here is uh, a sample of a degausser. That is a huge magnet. If you put a drive in, inside it, it will issue a magnetic pulse. That pulse will render any kind of magnetically stored data unreadable but it will also destroy the drive, so you can't reuse it after the gaussing. 
Uh, if you are using the Gaussing, you should be also uh, collecting the serial numbers so that you have um, uh, an audit trail and a track. And you should never put an SSD drive in a degausser. Because what uh, is the difference between SSD and HDD? Well, completely different storage technologies. So the SSD drive will actually maintain all data completely intact even after a degaussing uh, session. So make sure that you separate HDD and SSD when you are designing a good process. Um, physical destruction of drives, if you do it according to requirements and recommendations from the NSA, for example. An HDD, you need to shred down to six millimeter size uh, to be able to reach the highest level of security. An SSD, you need to grind it down or incinerate it down into two to three millimeter size to be 100% certain that uh, you cannot find pieces big enough that can contain significant data that can actually be quite easily recovered if you have access to uh, a lab. So if you are physically destroying, these are the standards that you need to reach. Um, a short summary of what the software industry can provide today. Basically, anything with a hard drive can be erased using software. But also, the industry requirements have grown. Uh, I've been in the industry for 20 years, and I've seen this from uh, IBM compatible Windows desktops uh, 20 plus years ago and today where you need to be able to target smartphones, tablets, laptops, desktop servers, storage equipment, very advanced drives that are used uh, by high-end storage solutions. You have to be able to go into virtual uh, environments and target virtual machines. You have to be able to target logical volumes. You have to be able to go into the cloud and target data using certain erasure processes. Um, you have to be able to look at SD cards and USB sticks. And most of all, doing an erasure uh, uh, process based on software um, you should always make sure that you're getting an audit track, um, uh, an audit trail, as well as a verification built into that uh, software process. So that's 20 years of development uh, in 20 seconds for you. And one thing that has really helped to um, uh, advance this industry is that there's a number of different uh, certifications and approvals available <coughs> excuse me uh, that software companies and vendors can um, uh, submit their solutions under and make sure that there are third-party verifications that this security process is actually 100% removing information and creating a correct audit trail so the availability for these kind of external tests and certifications have really advanced the industry uh, to a more mature level. And if we go back to Gartner and try to see what has happened over the last five years, um, basically uh, Gartner is covering uh, data sanitization in different technology hype cycles. Uh, data security hype cycle, uh, data privacy hype cycle. And for everyone focusing in on uh, the le legislation labyrinth, uh, uh, the privacy hype cycle is really interesting to read. But the conclusion, as we see, in 2015, they started covering data sanitization. And that has actually been moving quite rapidly towards that slope where you get to maturity in the end. 
Uh, but the main conclusion from Gartner is that this is a sea level requirement uh, that you need to be able to have under control. So a sea level requirement for all IT organizations. So as you are looking at your cybersecurity policies, talking about encryption, intrusion detection, data end of life through data sanitization is also one piece in that puzzle that you should plan uh, to incorporate. So what have we seen on the regulation side of things? Well, uh, when I got into this industry, there was one country in the world with a data privacy legislation. Today, we have a hundred plus and since the launch of the GDPR in Europe uh, in uh, uh, a couple of years ago, uh, we have seen a global trend uh, where there has been adoption rates around the world of very similar legislation. Um, if you look at privacy legislation, basically there are two things one need to realize. You, as the data controller, need to take all the different safety measures and precautions to avoid data leaks, to make sure that there's not a data breach because of poor data management, because of poor asset management. For example, leaving data on a hard drive and losing control of that hard drive. But uh, you also need to make sure that you have processes in place uh, where there cannot be any misuse of personal uh, data, i.e. that you are doing something with your customer's data that you have not gotten their approval to do. So protecting the data and using it in the right way. Those are the two main pillars that privacy legislation around the world are resting on. Um, in the US, we are seeing California taking the lead. Uh, the uh, CCPA is something that comes up in a lot of different debates and different policy discussions over the last uh, uh, couple of years. We have seen enhancements to the CCPA being voted through. Uh, and we are seeing many other states following. So this is a strong trend also on state level. Um, another thing that we see on state level and that you should uh, be aware of is that we have uh, state-specific data disposal policies. And this is something that um, uh, takes a little bit time to get insight to and research. But this is important as you put your policies and processes together to make sure that you understand what is the state requirements uh, on top of potentially industry requirements and federal requirements or global requirements if you're doing business in many different jurisdictions uh, around the world. Um, let's move quickly to the leading guidelines. Uh, if you're interested in this topic, you want to understand how to protect data through data end of life, data sanitization. Uh, there is a uh, leading document that is being referred to in the global arena as well as in North America. And this is something that you should write down and then Google uh, NIST 800-88 revision 1. Came out in December 2014 and have quickly become the go-to document uh, for anything that has to do with data sanitization. So if you have a policy in your organization referring to anything else, like the Department of Defense erasure standard, that is something that has been around since the mid-90s. Uh, that means that you should revise policies, you should make sure to update and connect it to uh, NIST 800-88 instead. Uh, there's a lot of good recommendations in this paper and uh, it's a recommended read for anyone interested in this topic. Um, 
In the NIST, you will find definitions of different security levels and how to deploy them within different uh, enterprise use cases and uh, processes. Um, you will uh, be able to read on um, uh, different principles uh, when it comes to secure uh, processing of both magnetic storage as well as SSD storage. And that is probably the biggest claim to fame for the NIST, uh, that it covers that in great detail. Um, there are several new uh, initiatives going on in the marketplace. Uh, so I do believe that we will see uh, updated publications that will have major impact. And you will also uh, find the ability that you can certify your organization towards uh, new ISO standards uh, that are in drafting stage and will come out in the market shortly. Uh, so keep an eye on uh, standards. Uh, I can recommend the International Data Sanitization Consortium, uh, where I'm engaged myself, where we do a lot of work trying to monitor what's happening and sharing that insight to anyone that is interested. Uh, on top of that, uh, if we just compare algorithms, uh, we need to be aware of that the DOD, as we mentioned, was developed early on only for magnetic, NIST clear and purge for both magnetic and SSD and different methods for uh, the underlying storage media. Uh, uh, NIST clear uh, gives um, uh, a very high level of security, but for the highest level of security, we refer to what we call NIST purge. So these are good basic terminologies that are uh, excellent to include in policy documents, for example. Um, I've also uh, collected a number of key use cases for you to consider uh, when you uh, uh, try to identify how should our organization look at uh, this uh, topic for data protection. How should we analyze our processes when trying to fit with legislation and getting through that labyrinth of uh, different requirements? And you need to look at customer demand. You need to keep track of your employee onboarding and departures. Uh, you need to have very good control of your uh, uh, asset life cycles, i.e. equipment end of life. Whenever you are migrating in or out of the cloud, that is an absolute uh, uh, key situation to monitor today. If you are running temporary data exercises like a disaster recovery exercise with live data, testing of systems, you should make sure that you have sanitization at the end of those processes. And then we have data retention, uh, data end of life. Uh, and if you're a global organization and you're struggling with keeping track of what are the different retention requirements on us as an organization around the world for different uh, jurisdictions, for different functions within the company, HR, finance, etc., do reach out to me afterwards. Uh, I can give you very good recommendations on specialized software as a service uh, suppliers that have basically mapped all the legislation in the world looking for uh, the correct data retention policies that you can map towards your own organizational needs. Uh, these are new initiatives, uh, newborn companies, but with great value to add uh, to any larger organization. So uh, do reach out and I can point you in the right direction on how to solve that very complicated question uh, if you are a big organization. Data retention policies. So from this summary uh, picture into where are we sitting today? Well, uh, most of you are still sitting in home offices just like myself. 
I'm in great company by my grandfather here on the wall behind me. He keeps me disciplined. Uh, but we need to be disciplined on how we handle data in our uh, home offices as well. And being uh, in the home office, uh, we need to make sure that we're not putting ourselves out for uh, social engineering attacks by posting pictures. We need to make sure that we are protecting the assets that we are using in that home office and that we are connecting to uh, our enterprise resources uh, in the best possible way. Uh, so there's a lot to consider. And uh, when we look around the world and uh, find out about um, uh, compliance pressure uh, that you are feeling around uh, uh, the home office equation, etc., that has severely gone up and uh, uh, we're all feeling that pain. But on the other hand, we've seen a lot of good uh, innovation uh, happening as well. There's also good uh, guidelines. Uh, NIST have uh, another guideline called 800-46 that can advise you on some security measures that are important uh, for the homework situation. Um, uh, when we think about how we're using uh, cloud services, we also start need to start thinking about how do we uh, characterize our data. Uh, we need to think about what's uh, ROT data, redundant, obsolete, trivial. Should this data uh, be uh, sitting in a cloud infrastructure or on-prem? Or is it something that we should get rid of in a secure way? Uh, we need to think about our infrastructure management as we're moving to the clouds. Are we sitting with redundant uh, infrastructure and how are we processing that infrastructure? What happens when we have data spillage and we're using cloud services from the home office or from on-prem? Um, another thing that we need to start putting processes in place to, uh, to be able to handle. So these are good things to consider uh, as we find ourselves in uh, uh, what many refer to as the new norm of uh, working. So what kind of um, uh, innovation are we seeing here? Well, there's a lot of uh, good examples. And when we talk about the specific topic of um, erasing data and achieving that data end of life, uh, we have seen a lot of deployments of how can this be achieved remotely? How can we uh, make sure to target uh, desktops or servers that need to be uh, re uh, replaced under a tech refresh program, for example. Uh, with skeleton crews, limited access to um, uh, different areas, uh, as well as scattered infrastructure. Uh, remote erasure processes have uh, exploded uh, during the last year. And what you should be aware of that uh, a year into this situation, there are now uh, very standardized methods, uh, good examples of how this can be done. And we see global organizations doing this, including uh, hundreds of different countries where IT assets are sitting under centralized uh, management. So key trend within the area, remote capabilities. Um, I can give you one example from a hyperscaler. Uh, this is a hyperscaler in North America uh, where they had to uh, decommission 4,000 servers overnight, but they did not have manpower in the data center. Uh, they could only do it uh, through central remote connection. So, they actually uh, made sure that they uh, clustered up and networked all uh, the different uh, uh, servers that needed uh, uh, the tech refresh. And in less than 10 hours, they were able to erase 4,000 servers, lived up to the NIST 800 standard, and uh, were able to collect erasure reports from uh, uh, 
around 24,000 drives in total uh, that is ready for uh, external audit or internal audit, for example. So uh, the scalability uh, that we have seen evolve over the last 12 months have been remarkable. Another key trend that I would like to highlight for you is integration. So what do I mean by integration? Well, for example, if you are using ServiceNow as your platform for asset management, of course, you would prefer to run workflows within ServiceNow to uh, include sanitization of a selected laptop or 100 desktops that are scheduled for uh, replacement or any kind of use case that you might come across within your organization. And today, we see these implementations uh, fully mature. Today, you can go on to ServiceNow Marketplace, for example, and find uh, ready packages for sanitization uh, utilizing the ServiceNow platform and easily integrate this into your existing routines and uh, uh, processes. So ServiceNow is one of those uh, great examples. Another one that is growing quickly when it comes to asset management is uh, Microsoft Intune or uh, device management within uh, the Microsoft ecosystem. And the same thing here. Uh, we see a number of large global organizations that are falling back on into uh, to manage endpoints and include into that management platform also the capability of performing uh, certified auditable uh, end of life uh, sanitization. So ServiceNow, Intune, uh, Splunk is another integration that we have seen uh, a lot where you need to capture the audit trail into some sort of centralized IT security dashboard, for example. Um, we see more and more of those uh, sort of monitoring capabilities that are in hot uh, uh, demand. Uh, if we're stepping into the data center, just using your standardized uh, tools from HP or Dell, ILO, IDRAC for managing your uh, desk uh, sort of um, server infrastructure and being able to implement uh, sanitization uh, workflows into those traditional server management platforms is also something that we have seen uh, develop a lot uh, over the last actually few years, uh, but escalating over the last year. So all of those are really uh, valuable and good um, uh, integration examples. Uh, so what we have covered so far uh, is um, uh, trends, integration. We have seen uh, how remote capabilities are important. And the driver there is very much uh, legislation and increased awareness and putting uh, data end of life and sanitization on the uh, security agenda, the board agenda even. Uh, but in parallel to navigating that um, uh, legal labyrinth and finding the right technical deployments, another global mega trend is sustainability. And I think just asking yourself, uh, how are you working with sustainability this last year or the last couple of years compared to 10 years ago. Most organizations and officers are uh, instantly responding that it's uh, very big differences on how sustainability is being approached today. And one part of sustainability is, of course, uh, green IT. Um, this is just uh, one example from a couple of years ago, and I'm afraid the trend uh, is still uh, going in the wrong direction, where there's more and more e-waste. And we're talking about um, Giza pyramids or thousands of Eiffel Towers, uh, depending on 
where you have traveled and your favorite destination and where you want to do your uh, parallels, but it's staggering amounts of uh, e-waste that we are seeing. And one contributing factor here is that you're actually removing drives from systems and destroying drives to protect the data. And then when a system is left without drives, that system is less likely to be reused uh, and extended in its life cycle uh, and is more likely to end up in some sort of um, uh, e-waste scenario where you might lose control down uh, the chain of custody or where that asset is finally ending up. Uh, so there's a lot of work that needs to be done uh, within this um, uh, uh, entire area of sustainability, but definitely within uh, IT aspects. And if we try to summarize um, what we want to achieve with um, uh, secure erasure and sanitizing an asset is, of course, that you can reuse it and resell it uh, or securely go into recycling processes where also the hard drives can be recycled without any fear for uh, data that previously has been on them. You can even earn carbon credits today. Carbon credits are being issued by different uh, bodies in the marketplace uh, when you can document uh, reuse instead of destruction of equipment. Um, you can use uh, CSR programs with um, uh, donation of equipment. So instead of destroying equipment, donating equipment uh, when you know that you don't have to fear uh, any kind of data leaks. So there's a lot to work on here. And uh, once again, it needs cooperation within the organizations. Cybersecurity needs to cooperate with corporate governance, uh, with IT operations, with finance to make sure that you can enable efficient asset lifecycle management from start to finish. Um, besides this, uh, I also would like to highlight that we have seen an enormous influx of investment capital that is going towards ESG qualified companies. And ESG uh, is environmental governance and social. Uh, and that means you have to be able to prove how you are performing within these different dimensions. And for most organizations, that will include uh, that you can provide data on uh, green IT, data on a reusable uh, workstation uh, solution, for example, uh, and that you're not destroying IT equipment uh, unnecessarily. So this is another mega trend that we have seen around the world uh, that is definitely uh, driving uh, these uh, technical questions up to strategic board level discussions. So to summarize uh, what we have been through, uh, we're just getting to our 40 minutes. Um, if you should bring one comment with you from this session, uh, use this quote from a CIO in a Fortune 100 company. No equipment leaves our site with data on it. And hopefully, during these 40 minutes, you have gained some insights in how to achieve that in a good way and still be in line with legislation as well as sustainability and finding out how best practices uh, can serve you as an organization. So with that said, uh, back to you, Shannon, uh, to see if we have any uh, questions uh, from these different aspects of uh, the presentation. Hi, Frederick. Thank you so much for this great presentation. And there's a lot of questions coming in. If you have questions for Frederick, please do submit them in the right-hand side in the Q&A section there. 
So diving in here, how can we secure deletion of data in the cloud and prove it? That's a great question and a hot trend. So today, uh, uh, we, for example, we have uh, a partnership with AWS. And uh, with AWS, uh, we have developed uh, specific erasure solutions for data stored uh, in the S3 cloud. Uh, in the EC2 cloud platform. So depending on how you're using your data in the cloud, if you're using AWS or Azure, there are a number of mature processes that can be deployed. And just as you're alluding to in your question, the key thing is to have an audit trail, how to prove it. So the audit trail is definitely there as a component in the process. and. Uh, I would love to follow up uh, afterwards and share more information on how this can be achieved, but it's definitely a hot topic. So very good first question. I love it. So uh, uh, the question is here, what is the biggest claim to fame? Biggest claim to fame within this industry is to make sure that there has never been any data leaks uh, when you have applied a sanitization process. And I know that when we are keeping track internally, we have approximately a quarter of a billion devices that have gone through our processes uh, without any data leaks. So I think that is a good claim to fame. So how do you, to cope with data, which by definition cannot be deleted, are there guidelines for what should not be written? Yeah, so blockchain. Um, blockchain is coming in uh, this industry, uh, but more from an audit trail perspective, i.e. how can we also add the blockchain values on how to keep track on what has been done, how to easily prove it by integrated into blockchain structures, for example. And that is something that is being worked on already. Um, when it comes to blockchain per definition, you should never issue anything that you don't want to share. I mean, that's the whole public domain around blockchain. So use it for audit trail and getting value from that, but then make sure that you do your information lifecycle analysis properly and exclude any sensitive data, data under legislation that shouldn't be shared from any kind of environment like that. So data information management and making sure that you are doing that analysis regularly and constantly, that is absolutely key. All right, so um, before removing data, what about backups? Do you have some experiences that you can share with that? Yes, so backups is always an aspect that needs a separate analysis. So when you're looking at your entire estate of data, you need to analyze and understand how are backup routines being performed? How is that backup data stored? Is it on-prem? Is it in the cloud? And here we come into data retention again. If it's data under retention requirements, of course, you need to keep the data. But after a retention period, you should actively, securely remove it. That's an important fact because uh, data can easily go from asset to liability if you're not managing your retention periods, for example, in a good way. So once you've done that joint analysis, uh, you will find different processes that can be applied, how to document that, and definitely you need to include your backup data estate when looking at the bigger picture. Great question. And I think we have time for a couple more questions here. We've got about five minutes left. So what about SAP data, which is written in sequential and is the uh, power of this database. Is it also erased to disk format level? 
So actually, back in the days, we, we developed a logical data sanitization solution together with SAP um, to target specific use cases. Here we come into very um, a detailed analysis where you need to look at, OK, which data can I target? How is that data stored? Is it block storage? Is it uh, some sort of um, uh, elastic storage? Is it in a database? And not all data can be targeted uh, for a uh, secure, verifiable sanitization process that creates an audit trail. So sometimes you actually have to conclude that this is data that's sitting in uh, a database environment. It cannot be targeted from external uh, resources. So we need to create a lot of security measurements around how we are managing this database, for example. Uh, but you have to look at this case by case and go into as much detail as possible to conclude what you can do and what is not possible to do. I hope that helps. Indeed. And I don't see any additional questions. Oh, here we go. One more. Uh, what is the standards we are following these days? So, uh, great question. Uh, looking around the world, uh, when it comes to actual technical standards and guidelines, uh, the NIST uh, 800-88 document that I referred to earlier is definitely uh, a key resource. There will be new material coming shortly. Um, I can also uh, recommend there's a specific uh, standard for storage security uh, called ISO 27040. That is also a really good um, uh, paper on uh, uh, how to implement storage security, including data sanitization. Um, other important standards to be aware of are different ISO uh, certifications. ISO 27011, that nothing can leave your site, for example, without uh, you sanitizing equipment before. 27018, that you can't redeploy storage assets uh, uh, in between use cases and customers, for example, uh, unless you have sanitized uh, the logical space in between. Uh, 27017, uh, uh, how to keep track of personal identifiable information. And then I would finally say it, it also depends on which industry you're in. If you're in the financial industry, the PCI requirements are extremely important uh, for how to process credit card information. If you're in the healthcare sector, super important to be aware of HIPAA. So look at your industry, look at ISO uh, programs, look at um, uh, industry initiatives, uh, look at um, uh, different NIST guidelines, and that will give you a very good uh, overview of what you need to follow. And if you have data retention uh, concerns, do get in touch, and I'll give you some great advice on where to turn. I love it. Frederick, well, thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. We just want to note again that there is a linked form at the bottom of the page titled EDW Conference Session Survey. This is where you can submit feedback for today's session. And that wraps us up. Um, you're welcome to continue networking with other attendees within the Spot Me app as we take a quick break between sessions. We look forward to seeing you then. And if you'd like to connect with Frederick, feel free to um, find him under the speaker section in the Spot Me app. Um, and he will uh, continue to answer your questions there. And don't forget to check out the sponsor booth. Click out, check out the sponsor session um, in between while we're on break, and we'll see you again here shortly. Frederick, again, thank you so much. My pleasure. Thank you very much for attending, and great questions, and I'd love to follow up if you have any follow-ups. Thank you very much. Over and out from Stockholm, Sweden. Bye for now. Thank you.